Oh, then we are live. All right, for those of you joining us now, we're waiting for a few more people to join us before we get started. So thank you. We're so excited to have you here. Welcome to Barrier Island Environmental Education Center. My name is Dave Green, and I am the director here. And along with me, we have... Hello, everyone. My name is Alden. I'm one of the naturalists here at Barrier Island. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, one thing, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, post them in the comment box below. And tomorrow at 11 a.m., we will answer those questions for you during our Q&A with the naturalists. So today we're going to be studying a very uh, unique, special ecosystem habitat here at Barrier Island. Uh, we have two freshwater ponds that were built about 30 years ago because, we, uh, because they knew the importance of having a, a source of fresh water here. Seabrook Island is surrounded by salt water from the Atlantic Ocean. So it's really important that we have a source of drinking water, you know, a place for a variety of wildlife to come and visit either short term or long term. You know, um, in a moment we're gonna be searching the pond or surveying the pond for aquatic insects or bugs. Along with that, we are gonna find a variety of amphibians such as frogs and salamanders. We also have quite a few different types of turtles that inhabit the ponds. Along with, we have some larger uh, organisms, American alligator. We, we just saw an osprey, a, a fish-eating bird that just flew over uh, looking for breakfast for this morning. Uh, the wetlands are, again, very important to have here. And we have freshwater ponds. We also have a slough, which is a special place. You'll probably get a chance to visit that on another one of our field excursions here at the camp. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little, <clears throat> excuse me, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the factors that are really important that you understand so then we have an idea of what we're actually gonna find in the pond. And one thing that is unique about the ponds here is they are what's called a, a lentic system or a closed system. Uh, the ponds here do not receive water from streams or springs they are strictly, uh, all the water comes from above, from the rain and from drainage. So to talk a little bit about some of these factors that, uh, that uh, will determine what kind of different organisms we're gonna find, we're gonna walk over and Alden's gonna talk about those now. So come on. Hello again, everybody. I'm here to talk about biotic and abiotic factors. Now, some of you have probably heard the word biology. Biology means the study of life. Bio, when you see that word, means life. So biotic factors, it's a science word, but it literally means living or once living things. Abiotic, when you put an A in front of bio, it negates it, which means it's the opposite. Abiotic is not biotic, not living factors. Some of the biotic factors here in our ponds are plants, algae, fish, turtles, alligators, leaves, insects, and a lot more. But these are some of the big ones. Leaves and trees, wood that falls into our pond, they're not still alive. If a plant falls and dies in our pond, it's not alive anymore. But it is still a biotic factor. A biotic factor is anything that is alive or was once alive. So, by that standard, the leaves, the twigs, the branches, 
All those things are biotic factors in our pond. Abiotic factors are not living and never have been alive. Things such as rocks, sand, the sun, rain, water, wind, and air are all abiotic factors that, although they are not alive, are necessary for life. The sun in particular is one of the most important abiotic factors. Without the sun, we wouldn't have food chains. The sun serves as the basis of all food chains by allowing producers in the forms of plants to photosynthesize and produce food for you and me and all the other organisms out there. If the sun didn't exist, the earth would be cold and dead. There would be no plants, there'd be no animals, there'd be nothing because nothing can live here without the sun. Rain is another incredibly important abiotic factor. As Dave said earlier, these ponds are rain fed. They are closed ecosystems and their only source of fresh water coming into them is coming from the sky. When we have a lot of rainfall, the level of the ponds will actually rise. And I've seen the ponds so high that they are almost at where my feet are currently. Additionally though, when it's really, really dry for a long period of time, the level of the ponds will lower as water evaporates and the ponds will recede. Our ponds are about eight feet deep in the center and they are slowly filling in over time through a process that is known as succession. Let's talk a little bit about the different zones of the pond. Come with me, let's take a closer look. So right here along the edge of the pond is the littoral zone. The littoral zone is literally around the edge. It is the area of land and water where they meet one another. It's where you will find plants growing. It's also where you'll find the vast majority of life here in our pond. The littoral zone is shallow. The sunlight can penetrate the water and allows plants to grow here. As you get out into the center of the pond, the open water out there is called the limnetic zone. The limnetic zone is where you will find our bigger critters, such as large fish, bass and sunfish, as well as turtles and even an alligator. Our pond has a very large American alligator. So the limnetic zone is where you'll find those larger organisms. The smaller critters don't want to go out into the limnetic zone because that is where they'll get eaten. So they hang out where it's safe in the littoral zone, where there's structure for them to hide. Additionally, there's one final zone and that is the benthic zone, which is the bottom zone of the pond. Benthic literally means bottom. A benthic fish is a fish that lives on the bottom of water. The benthic zone of our pond is the bottom of the pond. Now, the benthic zone doesn't have much living in it. In the benthic zone, you have a lot of plant and animal matter that is decomposing. The process of decomposing occurs with bacteria breaking down that material to its baser parts. This process eats up a lot of oxygen, which is one of those other important limiting factors. As the bacteria eat up all the oxygen in the benthic zone, there's not much oxygen down there. So fish and insects can't live there. Believe it or not, not only do you and I need oxygen, but animals that live in water need oxygen as well. Water has dissolved oxygen in it, and the insects and fish both breathe, breathe oxygen just like you and I. They just use different organs in order to do so. Let's take a look at some of the critters that live in our pond. We're gonna take a chance and see what we can catch. There you go. Thank you. So what we're gonna be doing, using for our tools, and this is, these are things that you could find right in your own home. We have strainers and they could be, you know, anything that's gonna strain the water. It doesn't have to be like the ones we have. We also have some ice trays. You might want to get permission before you take your ice tray from the freezer uh, or any bucket or container that you might find just to keep the organisms alive. So you want to fill those with water ahead of time so then when you catch 
organisms, uh, you'll have a place to put them immediately. And as Alden mentioned, we're going to be looking along the edge, and this is where all sorts of different organisms are going to find shelter and protection. So we're going to just do some scooping and see what we can find. Whoa! Oh my gosh! An osprey just dove into the pond going after fish. Did you get that? I did. That's oh incredible. God. And that was in the what zone? Limnetic. The limnetic zone. So they didn't come to the edge. Yes. Oh. Oh my gosh! There it is again. There are two of them. Whoa. That is incredible. Nature can put on quite a show sometimes. And again, those are called osprey. They look a little bit like bald eagles, but they're much, much smaller. And if you look closer, the color patterns are much different. But that is you know, a definite good sign you know, of having a large predator like that coming and eating. In regards awesome. to the uh, activity we're about to do, you can do this in any source of fresh water that you happen to live near. In this time of quarantine, if you have time to go outside and if you have a creek or a pond by your property, then you can go and take a strainer with your parents' permission and go and see what cool little organisms that you can find. We're going to try that now. I got a water beetle. I found a... Ooh, and a little damselfly larva. Yeah, I got one too. A damselfly. So again, what we want to do is train your go? eye to look for these small different organisms. A leaf, just like this, that has fallen from an oak tree provides shelter and habitat for a lot of different organisms. So it's really important that you flip over each leaf or other vegetation that's in here. And right here, I don't know if you could see it, but crawling, we're gonna talk about them a little bit more, but there's, a, let me move that leaf out of the way. So there's a juvenile or baby dragonfly along with a damselfly that's right beside it. So again, when you lift these, lift the water, lift your strainer out of the water, you wanna just pause and just look very closely at things squirming around in here. And what we're looking for specifically, these are all called macroinvertebrates. And macroinvertebrates is basically a fancy way of saying big bugs. So macro meaning big and invertebrates means no backbone. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at some of these that are in the water. So what we have here is one of, it's one of the top predators that you're gonna find in the insect world here in the pond. Believe it or not, this is actually a juvenile or baby dragonfly. And if you look closely, there are similar characteristics like the large compound eyes, the large head, and attached to the thorax, which is the middle part of its body, you have what's um, starting, uh, you can see some wings starting to grow. And then of course, the back end, the third part of an insect is the abdomen. This is, as I mentioned, is a carnivore or meat eater. So they will take down fish and we're gonna see if we can show you how large of a mouth they have. They have this, uh, isn't that awesome? Yeah. They have a scoop-like appendage that scoops out um, and just scoops up different organisms. They pull that in and then they just devour it. They also have a real unique way of breathing is, uh, as I believe Alden mentioned before that, you know, we breathe using lungs dragonflies, uh, baby dragonflies, they have gills inside their abdomen. So they pull water in through their rectum, they take out the oxygen that they need, and then they expel that extra excess water, um, which causes them to move forward like a jet. 
And we do have an adult dragonfly that emerged after being in the water for quite a long time as a juvenile or nymph. And when the juvenile decides it doesn't want to be in the water anymore, it crawls out onto a piece of grass or cattail and starts to dry off and it gets rid of that exoskeleton and out emerges an adult dragonfly, which are very, very beneficial because they like to eat Mosquitoes. What, what Mosquitoes. These guys are some of the most efficient predators on the planet, believe it or not. A tiger is one of the most efficient mammals. And if a tiger goes after an animal 10 times, it will catch its prey four times out of 10. A dragonfly, on the other hand, if it goes after its prey, which is usually mosquitoes, 10 times, it's getting a mosquito more than nine times out of 10. They are the most efficient predators on the planet. They are incredible little critters. Let's talk about some of the other insects that we've got though. Yeah, another predator that I'm holding here is what's called a damselfly. And they look very similar to a, a dragonflies as an adult, but as a juvenile or nymph, they look much different. Their body is very slender. If, I don't know if you could see, but they have three feather-like tails, which are actually the gills, and that's how it breathes. So this is, again, this is a damselfly nymph. Uh, we also have several beetles that we caught, and something really interesting about beetles is if you look closely while the beetle is swimming, it has a silvery appearance to its um, on its under on its abdomen and what they do is because they need oxygen as Alden mentioned earlier so what they'll do is actually trap a air bubble on their um, abdomen swim around in the water and that oxygen will slowly absorb through its skin so the need to go up to the surface constantly is not there um, they're but, like little yeah. scuba divers with their own personal biological scuba gear. Yeah, and again, there's a lot of other, yeah, we have some duckweed, which is a very common plant, one of the producers. And here at this pond, yeah, we have an abundance of other, you know, small mosquito fish. And we have, I don't know if you're able to see these, Abigail, but in this little tray, this little pocket here, we have what are called amphipods or scuds. They're actually a type of crustacean and they're plant eaters uh, or they also like to eat detritus and that's a fancy way of saying dead animals and plants that are decomposing. So even an organism this small is so beneficial you know to this. Yeah. Okay go ahead keep okay. going. Our, we got yeah. disconnected for a second. Keep oh. going. So yeah, so so the importance of you know collecting and monitoring aquatic insects, you know, is so vital because it can tell you, it can give you a picture of how healthy the water is, how much oxygen it is. You know, so if we were doing a true survey, we would want to count every single insect or other organism that we're finding, and that would give us a true picture of and seeing how many damselflies there are in what we've caught. The quality Definitely. of our ponds is actually really, really good. Mm -hmm. This is a very healthy aquatic ecosystem with many, many different insects that rely on it and make it their home. The water quality is good enough for almost any insect in the area to be able to make use of these ponds, and they do. This is where many baby insects start their lives and grow up. Yeah, and all these insects basically are providing food for other larger predators, you know, such as frogs and turtles and salamanders, the ones that we birds. always like to see. Yep. As well as the bird that we saw, the osprey, <laughs> that was just awesome. So again, it's, you know, this is um, just kind of a little picture of what one of our pond studies might look like. And, and as Alden mentioned, you don't have to have a big pond like this. You could even have, you know, different organisms like this in your front ditch, you know, or if you have if a If you have a drainage ditch yeah. near your house, 
chances are there are aquatic insects. They might not be quite the same as the ones that you'll find in a pond, but chances are there are aquatic insects out there. Now, from Barrier Island, we want to say thank you for tuning in, and we're so glad to have all of you watching. Please like and subscribe our YouTube page, and put any comments or questions here on our Facebook page. We have loved answering the questions in our Q&As. We have a Q&A session tomorrow at 11 a.m. So please tune in for that and leave any and all questions that you have right here. We love to answer questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. All questions are valid and all questions are good. Questions are the absolute best way to learn. So don't hesitate to ask. From everyone at Barrier Island, thank you again.